Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. On this edition of Defense News Weekly, the arms race for hypersonics continues to build as Russia claims use of the weapons in Ukraine. But as the U.S. develops its own weapons, questions arise about whether the military is taking the right approach. We also get a first-hand look at a new type of Marine training and how the Corps is changing its enlisted command structure. Plus, the Czech Republic looks into expanding its helicopter fleet. Find out what it plans to buy. And new information on what caused a B-2 Spirit stealth bomber to skid off a runway in fall 2021. It's the latest in news and analysis from the Pentagon to the platoon. This is Defense News Weekly. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly, I'm Andrea Scott. For this week's news, we head straight over to Daniel Wolfolk, who talked to reporter Stephen Losey about the U.S. strategy in hypersonic weapons development. With Russian forces claiming to have used the weapons in strikes in Ukraine, the developing tech continues to demand attention. Here's part of their conversation. The Russian military claims it has hit a shopping mall with a Kinzhal hypersonic missile on the outskirts of the Ukrainian capital of Kyiv because it had allegedly been used to store rockets. Russian Defense Ministry spokesman Major General Igor Konashenkov said on Monday that Ukrainian forces were using the shopping mall to store multiple launch rocket systems and store ammunition used for shelling Russian troops. General Konashenkov's claims could not be independently verified, but the Russian military also said it will continue using its state-of-the-art hypersonic missiles to hit targets in Ukraine. Kinzhal was developed by Russia in recent years and has a range of about 1,250 miles and flies at 10 times the speed of sound. It's carried by custom redesigned MiG-31 fighter jets. Konashenkov said the Kinzhal hypersonic missile has, quote, proven its efficiency in destroying heavily fortified special facilities. He added that a Kinzhal missile was used earlier this month to hit a Soviet-era arsenal for storing missiles in the Carpathian Mountains. It was also used in a strike on a fuel depot near, in the Black Sea near the port of Mykolov. Konashenkov noted that the Kinzhal was used for these strikes due to its high kinetic energy and its ability to penetrate defenses. Konashenkov said that the Kinzhal missiles were fired at a distance of more than 620 miles. So where does the United States' hypersonic missile development stand? To that, we turn to Defense News Air Warfare reporter Stephen Losey, who joined us earlier for this week's Actionable Intelligence. You've been covering hypersonic weapons for quite some time, and recently we've had a, a couple stories that really give a snapshot of where the United States is in its hypersonic weapons development. And we'll go into that, but first, can you give us a little bit of a summary for un uninitiated viewers of what a hypersonic weapon is compared to, say, an intercontinental ballistic missile? Hypersonic weapons are a uh, advanced weapons capability that the United States, as well as China and Russia, have been working on. They can travel multiple times the speed of sound, greater than Mach 5, and they can maneuver mid-flight. This makes them capable of penetrating defenses and it's a lot harder to track and shoot them down than, say, a uh, conventional ballistic missile, which tends to follow a fixed parabolic track. And Stephen, hypersonic weapons are a priority, and Congress brought in Pentagon officials to talk about where they are, as well as members of industry. What did they hear? They heard from the defense industry some of their concerns about the multiple obstacles that are still in the path for developing hypersonic weapons things such as supply chain difficulties, uh, sluggish acquisition processes, uh, a lack of enough testing facilities such as wind tunnels, uh, things like that. And that's what the Pentagon uh, is going to try to 
see if they can do something to improve that to try to speed up the process of testing and developing hypersonic weapons. And you mentioned testing, and that's kind of one speed bump that everybody hit very recently was a failed test. And, and what happened with that with regard to the budget? How did that affect the budget? Yeah, the, the Air Force's primary hypersonic weapon they're working on is called the Aero, Air Launched Rapid Response we Weapon. Uh, it had a couple of tests last year. They all had problems um, with the, in the launching process. The Air Force is working on trying to uh, sort out, and a Lockheed Martin are trying to sort out what uh, happened there. They're hoping to do some testing. However, the repeated testing failures and delays had a pretty serious budgetary impact in the uh, omnibus spending bill that Congress uh, passed earlier in March. Now, the budget had originally called for $161 million in procurement funds to buy Aero weapons. However, uh, congressional appropriators said that because of the testing failures and delays in the Aero program, they struck those procurement funds entirely, uh, took half of it away entirely, and put the other half back in research, development, testing, and evaluation for the Aero pro program. So uh, Air Force Secretary Frank Kendall, who's raised some um, very hard questions about the hypersonic program in recent months, said after the release of that budget that the Aero program still has to prove itself. And there'll be surely years of development in this, and it seems like all eyes are on China, who's developing hypersonic weapons. Secretary Kendall did say something along the lines of, hey, we don't need to keep up with the Joneses with what, what China's doing. Tell us a little bit about his thoughts there. That's right. Secretary Kendall is trying to encourage the, uh, the military and the defense industry to take a very strategic look of, at hypersonic weapons, what we would use them for, and how um, the target set that the United States might want to strike differs from China. Now, Kendall points out that um, right now hypersonic weapons are best suited to f striking fixed targets. For China, that might mean shooting a hypersonic weapon at a United States aircraft carrier um, while it's still in port. The United States, on the other hand, is focused on trying to de deter and defeat aggression, which could conceivably be, for example, Chinese ships heading towards Taiwan. That's a moving target. That might not be the best um, uh, use of a hypersonic weapon, is what Kendall is wondering. And could the US hit those same targets with a conventional weapon uh, just as effectively, but more cheaply, because hypersonic weapons are considerably expensive. The U.S. is expecting to spend about $15 billion between uh, 2015 and 2024. Uh, some estimates say they could run about $100 million a shot. So there's a lot of money that goes behind that firepower. And Secretary Kendall wants the, gov the, the military to ask, is this the best use of our resources uh, to pursue these weapons? That's a lot going on with hypersonics, Stephen. Thank you for joining us. Glad to be here. The Czech Republic is planning to buy additional UHY Venom and AH-1Z Viper helicopters for its military. As Russia's invasion of Ukraine has demonstrated the country's existing fleet is, quote, insufficient. That's according to Defense Minister Yana Sernoshova. Sernoshova added the Ministry of Defense has all the prerequisites to catch up to the 2% of gross domestic product spending, which is part of NATO member countries' commitment to the alliance. During her recent meeting with U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, Sernoshova discussed the ministry's interest in purchasing additional choppers made by Bell Helicopter because she said, it turns out the 12 machines the Czech military will receive next year are insufficient, and that's due to the situation in Ukraine. The number of helicopters that the Czech Republic aims to acquire was not disclosed, but local industry observers expected Prague to purchase a further 12 helos on top of its first order. In 2019, the Czech government decided to buy eight UH-1Y Venom and four AH-1Z Viper helos with related gear and services under a deal worth about $645 million. We now know why a B-2 Spirit stealth bomber skid off the runway in September. The incident happened at Whiteman Air Force Base, Missouri, and damaged the aircraft. 
A recent Air Force Global Strike Command investigation showed that the bomber's left main landing gear collapsed because it didn't provide enough pressure to keep it in its locked position. The springs hadn't been replaced in at least a decade and perhaps never, according to the report. It should have been replaced every nine years. Repair costs were estimated to be at at least $10.1 million in the report. The final cost could end up being much higher. The investigation said engineers need to take a closer look for internal structural damage to its left wing. The publicly released report does not get specific about the extent of the damage to the bomber's highly delicate, low observable stealth coating. There were no injuries resulting from the landing. The Air Force has 20 B-2s in its fleet, which cost about $1.1 billion apiece. The Spirit of Georgia was delivered to white men in December 1995. In around the world, Japan says Russian amphibious ships transiting through a narrow strait between its islands could be moving fresh forces from Russia's far east to Ukraine. Four landing ship tanks, including one with its deck full of military trucks, were seen sailing in the Pacific Ocean westbound in the middle of last week. That comes from an announcement by Japan's Defense Ministry. The ships were traveling in two groups. Photos released by the ministry showed the top deck of one ship with at least 17 military trucks. All four ships also have internal holds capable of carrying various cargo or troops. Japanese media reported the ministry believes the ships were bringing additional units from Russia's Far East to shore up its forces involved in the invasion of Ukraine. That claim was backed up by Ukraine's own defense ministry. And that's it from around the defense world. After the break, new training for Marines under a new enlisted structure and U.S. troops make a visible presence in Romania. Welcome back. Over in Europe, with countries on NATO's eastern edges uneasy following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, U.S. forces have made an effort to train with them. One of the more recent joint missions, Romanian troops and the U.S. 2nd Cavalry Regiment. The U.S. Army's 2nd Cavalry Regiment recently sent about 800 soldiers to Romania to train with local troops as part of a show of force in response to Russia's recent invasion of Ukraine. The American troops stationed in Vilsack, Germany, teamed up with the Romanian 9th Mechanized Brigade for live fire and artillery exercises. It's very good because, once again, it grows clear in the alliance, in the alliance of the North Atlantic, Uh, cred că prin dislocarea și creșterea efectivelor pe teritoriul României s-a demonstrat uh, coerența și uh, faptul că alianța poate dizloca și poate sprijini întreg flancul estic, întreg flancul estic al uh, alianței nord-atlantice. Pe de altă parte, uh, faptul că lucrăm împreună pentru că La această oră sunt mai multe națiuni care au dislocat trupe. Vorbim de Olanda, vorbim de Franța, vorbim de Italia, vorbim de Germania și, bineînțeles, Statele Unite. Toate, ță- toate țările care s-au dislocat pe teritoriul României practic arată solidaritate și faptul că sprijină întreg flangul estic. Troops did a variety of coordinated movement and live fire exercises and also flew joint training missions. We really just get a chance to learn a lot um, from the Romanians and see how their army operates and how it operates uh, with ours and just show like how well we can uh, link in with each other um, and do our jobs together whenever uh, NATO needs us to. The U.S. has been repositioning thousands of troops around NATO countries as a show of support for the alliance following the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Since February, more than 12,000 U.S. forces have been put on heightened alert for possible deployment as events develop. And back at home, the Coast Guard returns to its regular schedule of harrowing rescues caught on tape. This time, Coasties from the cutter Alex Haley hoisted an injured man from a 260-foot fish processing boat in heavy seas near the port of Dutch Harbor in the Aleutian Islands chain of Alaska. After the successful extraction, the man was flown to a nearby hospital for treatment of serious foot injuries. And part of the defensive weapons the U.S. is sending to Ukraine is now known to be the Switchblade drone. Smaller, faster, and harder to spot than the Turkish TB2 drones being used by Ukraine's forces, the Switchblades could give them a new capability. 
Known as a loitering munition, the lightweight switchblades are single-use weapons fired from a tube that hover over a target, then turn themselves into a small warhead and drop on the target kamikaze style. The Switchblade 300 model weighs about 5 pounds, flies up to 15 minutes at a time, and is designed to be carried in a backpack, assisting small infantry units tracking the Russians' movements. The Switchblade 600, by comparison, weighs about 50 pounds, flies up to 40 minutes, and can target armored vehicles. And that's it from Around the Military. When we come back, tips on understanding the differences between a credit card and a debit card. Welcome back. On this edition of Money Minute, Navy Federal Credit Union personal finance expert Jeanette Mack walks you through the differences between credit and debit cards. According to the Census Bureau, over 70% of American households have credit cards, but debit card users greatly outnumber credit card owners in the U.S. It may be because younger consumers hold misconceptions about credit cards versus debit. It's important to know the difference so you can use one or both to your best financial advantage. Looking at them side by side, both will have the logo of a major credit card company, but the difference is the debit card pulls funds directly from your checking account to fulfill the cost of your purchase immediately. Debit cards may not help you build credit, but they're cheaper to use than credit cards having fewer fees and no finance charges, and of course, no ensuing debt, while credit cards use funds borrowed from the card issuer to fulfill your purchases, giving you the buying power you need with the flexibility to pay over time. Credit cards do come with finance charges and limitations on how much credit you can use, but they're also a great way to earn rewards or cash back for your purchases, making the most of your money. And of course, credit cards help you build your credit history. There's a need and room in your wallet for both credit and debit. They're excellent financial tools to have at the ready. You just have to be smart and use each of them in ways that are in your best interest always. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll see you next time. For more around-the-clock coverage of military and defense stories, head over to Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps Times.com and DefenseNews.com for the latest updates. And to get a curated list of top stories in your inbox every weekday, subscribe to our Early Bird Brief. And make sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. After the break, new training for Marines under a new enlisted structure. And U.S. troops make a visible presence in Romania. Welcome back. The U.S. military is all about adaptation, and maybe no branch more so than the Marines. Recently, reporter Philip Athey got a first-hand look at some updated structure and training changes the Corps is pushing forward. He stopped by to tell us what he saw. Philip, you recently returned from West Virginia where Marines were training with a little bit of a different type of battalion. Tell me about it. Basically, the battalion's restructuring, um, pushing, the uh, weapons company down to the platoons, so they have anti-take weapons, heavy machine guns, mortars. Um, it's also uh, implying more mature leadership uh, to those companies so that they can act better independently. So give us a snapshot of what an infantry battalion looks like right now. Where are the mortars? Where are the, the squad weapons? Yeah, so uh, in the Marine Corps, you pretty much have three line companies. Um, those are just mostly made up of 0311s, just standard riflemen. In addition to them, um, you're gonna have a weapons company that's going to have the mortars that's going to have you know the anti-take weapons and that's going to have the heavy machine gun specialists you know marines that are, are trained they're infantrymen trained specifically to use those weapons you mentioned maturity what does that mean within a unit uh they're pretty much changing uh the command structures on the enlisted side specifically they are making um squad leaders staff sergeants previously they were sergeants or even more junior they're making platoon sergeants gunnery sergeants um, and they're making the uh, senior enlisted advisor uh, at the company level a master sergeant, whereas before it was a gunnery sergeant. So basically, they're moving everyone down one leadership level. So essentially, if you want the next job up, you're going to have an additional stripe needed for it than you do right now? Yes. Um, and that, that's caused some consternation uh, amongst uh, the, the infantry uh, uh, enlisted, especially since, you know, uh, when these guys were coming up, um, there was a shortage of uh, infantry leaders. So a lot of the, uh, the current squad leaders were squad leaders as lance corporals, platoon sergeants as corporals, or even lance corporals in some instances. And now they're going back to what they were doing, the same job they were doing about 10 years ago. At the end of the day, they kind of you know, came around to the understanding that 
yes, I'm only operating a squad, but I'm still have the trust that I had as a platoon uh, sergeant. Did the end of, of our efforts in Afghanistan kind of prompt this? Is, is there, are they looking somewhere new? The Marine Corps in particular is looking at China and, and, and how to counteract and deter um, China, Chinese aggression in the South China Sea um, and in the Pacific. Um, and, and this force kind of sees it as uh, if we can have platoons led by gunnery sergeants um, or with the senior leadership of a gunnery sergeant, they can go out and they can control a small island, a small to atoll in the, in, the, in the South Pacific, and with their greater uh, weapons from the weapons company, have greater effect on that area, protect, you know, bring in an anti-ship missile um, from themselves, and then have a platoon basically blocking off a giant sea lane. What did it look like to you in West Virginia when they were training? It, it was a little bit colder in West Virginia than they were used to down in North Carolina. Um, so there were, you know, there were some adjustments and some, and some worries there, but you know they were eager to kind of go out and, and try this new concept. This is one of their first experiments where they're really getting to kind of sink down um, into those uh, independent, individually operating roles um, and, and see how far they can go. And last I checked, West Virginia is a landlocked state. Is this going to be kind of on the ground changes or is this going to affect the way the Marine Corps fights in the ocean and amphibiously? They were in the mountains of West Virginia. They kind of notionally made that an island um, and, and they surrounded it by notional water. Um, and then they, they were brought in on notional uh, MV-22s that looked a lot like buses. Um, oh. So uh, in theory, this, they, were folk, they were training as if they were part of that small island um, operating force, uh, as if they were operating on that small island. Um, but the Marine Corps does claim that this will work in any battlefield. And now that they're not focusing so much on counterinsurgency and they're, as the Marine Corps has been saying for a few years, getting back to their roots, is the way the infantry fights going to be a little bit different? The entire Marine Corps is focused on getting that leading infantryman whatever support he needs. Um, and that's kind of changing a little bit. Now the infantry is going to be acting in a support role for the Navy, for you know, the rest of the joint force. They're going to be um, taking and holding lands, pinning down the opposing Navy, and allowing, you know, naval capital ships to operate wherever they want freely. Um, and, and that's a bit of a, a role reversal for, for the Marine, uh, Marine Corps infantry. They are used to kind of being the main focus, and now they're not. Um, again, I talked to some Marines on the ground, and, you know, they said that, that, that took a little adjusting to, but as they've continued on in this experiment, at the end of the day, they're still doing infantry stuff. I see, and that's something that, that Marines have been known to do really well. Philip, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And that's all we have time for this week. Please visit us on militarytimes.com and defensenews.com for more coverage. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week.